Let's begin here. Uh, we're looking at Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And um, uh, as I said to you, the uh, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner uh, was part of the um, great uh, lyrical ballads. And uh, let me make a little comment on that, because I think I said something about it last time. But uh, in 1817, in a work called the Biographia Literaria, uh, Coleridge explains the differences between the two approaches, like what we're reading today is very different in tone than uh, Wordsworth's poems. And uh, apparently that was intentional. So there's a real uh, uh, tension there. Now, I will also say, but as a prefatory remark, uh, Wordsworth was not very happy with Coleridge's contributions. He said that uh, they were inferior to his, they, they jarred with the style, etc., and so forth. But this is Coleridge's comments. He said, uh, the thought suggested itself, to which of us I do not recollect, that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In the one, incidents and agents were to be, in part at least, supernatural. And the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by the dramatic truth of such emotions as would normally or naturally accompany such situations, supposing them real. And real in this sense they have been to every human being who from whatever source of delusion has at any time believed himself under supernatural agency. For the second class, subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life. In this idea originated the plan of the ly lyrical ballads. Now, of course, um, the first group of poems are Coleridge's and the second is, are Wordsworth's. So the first group have supernatural agents and they uh, will have natural emotions attending them and vice versa, there's a natural situation and yet there's a suggestion of a supernatural. Now, the um, uh, American literary critic M.H. Abrams says that this is what describes romanticism in general, this uh, natural supernaturalism is the, the phrase that he uses. It's actually not his phrase, it's Thomas Carlyle who came up with this description. But it talks about this, uh, what I referred to in a rather less um, poetic form, the panentheism that we know, the idea of the God in uh, the common day, uh, the, in, uh, the mixture of the two. <coughs> this is a great poem in its own right and uh, has been received as such, but it was one, it, the, Coleridge only contributed a few poems to that uh, initial collection. And uh, eventually, and he acknowledged that Wordsworth was the superior poet and Coleridge largely devoted himself to being a critic, uh, of which he was an excellent one. Um, one of those chiefly responsible for our uh, esteem of William Shakespeare. So he wrote great works of criticism on Shakespeare, and in particular, his attention to the emotional life of the characters, which he thinks makes Shakespeare uh, vivid and powerful. Uh, so he focuses on the interior life of the, of the characters, and I think Shakespeare's particularly good at that. But um, as far as this particular poem, oh, and I will say one final thing, um, and it's just total aside. On April 1st, our class, uh, will, we're going to have a visitor. Uh, Malcolm Geit is his name, a Cambridge professor. He's a poet uh, and a scholar. He's just produced uh, a biography of Coleridge. Uh, called Mariner, and also a theological commentary on this particular poem. And he's going to address the class, and hopefully others will invite others to come in and hear him. But um, I think that'll be a real treat. But it'll be on this. Uh, it'll be somewhat related to this poem, uh, and 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 more broad than that, though as well. I might I might interview him. We'll see. We're I, we're going to discuss exactly what we do with that. But uh, just something to look forward to. Uh, I'll let you know, know more about this. Uh, the context for this were, were um, not just what I've said about the approach, but probably also um, voyage travelogues. In the 18th century, uh, James Cook was voyaging around the South Seas and the Pacific Ocean, 
and he was sending back with him by ship and letters and so forth uh, the stories of what he saw and what and those he met and the landscape and so forth. So this is the new world. They're the first man to have sailed there, British, uh, and, and come back with reports of what he sees. So these are people that had never been encountered by, by Europeans, uh, the South Sea Islands. And uh, as, it, as it turns out, um, Coleridge's tutor, that is the man who taught him, uh, his name was William Wales, the current Prince of Wales name, I think, mm -hmm. William Wales, but that was the name of Coleridge's <coughs> tutor, was the astronomer on Cook's flagship. So he would have brought back with him uh, first-hand accounts and probably spoken of that to the young Coleridge as he was growing up. And um, so I think that, that is a plausible influence as well because the, this is a voyage down to the south uh, and talking about things that, again, were wonders, marvelous to the European imagination. So it's not just, he didn't just pluck it out of anywhere, he's probably got it from that. And uh, three times he went into the Antarctic Circle even, so the description of the ice flows and so forth would be, um, you know, very uh, in the foremost of his mind. And um, so I think that's enough. I don't want to do too much uh, intro because I want to actually spend most of the time on the poem. Uh, it is... Um, Let's see here. Oh, for one final comment, and I don't know if it's in here in this text. Is it in this text? No, it's not in this text. Okay, but it's in your text that's in your uh, volume. It has a uh, something called a gloss in the margin. It's not on this because it, it's really hard to do that on the internet. I don't know. I brought a proper romantics. I brought, yeah. 137? 937, yes. And it, it has the gloss as well. Now, let me, say, let me make a brief comment on that. So there's the main text, now, uh, which is on the right in our case. And on the left, there's a little summary statement of what's happened there. Now, this is the gloss. The, the little account on the left is the gloss. It's the summary or um, a commentary even. And it's sort of interesting that a writer should write a commentary on his own work within the body of the work. So the relation between the commentary and the original text is, is of interest as well. And that was added later. So the original text did not have, like when it was first published, did not contain the gloss. The gloss was brought in after the fact. And the gloss, uh, you will note, at first states the most mundane, trivial, and almost ridiculous comments. Like, why is this, why does he even bother with this? But then later on, there will be disjunctures between the commentary and what's happened in the text. And we will br be brought into the position where we're wondering, which should we trust, the commentator or the text? That's obviously intentional. And Coleridge is saying something about commentaries and the nature of commentaries and the way that they influence us and the way we read. And a very great interest to Coleridge, as I say, the great literary critic, is how the critic has biases that can influence the reading of, uh, of the work and uh, of interest to me as well. I mean, it's one of the reasons why when I teach undergraduates, I don't get into the commentators too much. Um, not that they're not useful, they can be, but I would first and foremost like to read the text and let the text speak to us before uh, inserting the comment commentary of other critics or even myself to some degree I try and let you know what is the author saying here and then of course you have to make a comment because it's impossible not to have any biases but uh, but that that itself the gloss is also an interesting part of, of the text so let me with without further ado um, start reading it and uh, and then I'll, I'll read the whole first part and then we'll move on and I'll, I'll, I'll comment then only after having read it. So it is an ancient mariner and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stops thou me? The bridegroom's doors are opened wide and I am next of kin. 
the guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, gray beard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat, st sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop. Below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sun came he. And he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose which is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest, he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his oar-taking wings and chased us south along. With sloping masts and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward aye we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold. And ice, mast high, came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts, the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen. Nor shapes of men, nor beasts we can, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there. The ice was all around, it cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swoon. At length did cross an albatross, through the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow. And every day, for food or play, came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whilst all the night through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why look'st thou so? With my crossbow, I shot the albatross. Okay, so that ends part one. <clears throat> what do you note about the <coughs> cadence of the poem, the style of the poem? Compare it and contrast it. It rhymes. Good title, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, right? It is as advertised. And the other thing you can note about it is the, uh, some of the uh, languages is uh, ant not just antiquarian, but obsolete. Eftsoons and so forth. I mean, deliberately, self-consciously. It's not that they use these words in the 19th century even. He's trying to, um, so if you don't know the words, don't feel ignorant. He, it's, it's intentionally... Uh, casting a certain um, aura over the poem, uh, talking about strange things in strange language. And the, uh, what's the effect of the rhyme, though, in hearing it? Does it sound like a normal story that you would tell? Is it, does it have the same sense that Wordsworth did when he wrote Tintern Abbey or The Immortality Ode? What's, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm just impressions. It, why? Because it sounds almost contrived? Yes. So artificial. I, I don't speak in rhyme. Do you speak in rhyme? No, no. So whenever you write, I mean, as far as I know, I've never met anyone who speaks in rhyme. We, we, but old stories are, are written often in rhyme and memorable as such. So the earliest uh, stories that we read and delight in in childhood are nursery rhymes. 
And uh, by writing in rhyme, it has a sort of an incantatory quality or a magical quality to it. It's, how, it's artificial, as you say, in a sense that this is not real. I think that's what you said. And uh, I think that's correct. And the reason we have that sense is it's not told in regular language. It's told in very highly um, poetic or art artificial language. So it's self-consciously artificial. So it uses artifice, ver verbal artifice. And conspicuous, we, we can hear it. The other thing about rhyme is it gives a strong sense of um, order. Not just order, harmony. That, that's what I'm talking about, the sense of uh, the supernatural on it. There's a sense of order that's too orderly, a little bit too perfect here. And it not only is the, the rhyme, it's the meter. And I, when I read it, you could probably hear it was quite a regular meter. Yes? The other thing about the, the meter, he's writing an iambic uh, tetrameter by and large. Mm -hmm. So a tetrameter um, has an even stronger sense of symmetry because there are two lines, there are two uh, metrical feet on one side and two on the other. It's the meter that's used of, of uh, hymns often. Hymns are written I in iambic tetrameter mm -hmm. because of the sense of balance and order that goes with it. And the adding rhyme to it makes it even more so. It sounds like a song. And it has been put, it's been, it's been uh, taken up by um, singers and other artists as well. It's been very influential. It's in movies as well. I think, gosh, I'm trying to think, what, what's the name of that Russell Crowe movie? Uh, Master and Commander. I think there's a scene there that is in it. Uh, he might be describing the myth of the Flying Dutchman, which um, was, in, was influential on Wagner's operas, but uh, elsewhere as well. Um, who knows? He, he could have any of those things in mind or, or none of them, but I, I think yeah. most certainly he does have those. Obviously not Wagner. Wagner is writing after this. But um, uh, Okay, but that's the uh, comment on the just the sort of the, the, the language per se. How about the content in it? Who are the protagonists here? Yes. Okay, so the there. Oh, sorry. The mariner's on the boat. Yes. So he and he's the one who does the shooting. Yeah. So the, there's the um, um, the protagonists are the ancient mariner, uh, one of the wedding guests, and that's it. Actually, those are the two characters. There are two people, chiefly. There's the ancient mariner who's telling the tale, and the tale he's telling is about the adventure that he lived. Now, the guest that he stopped is one of three. There are three wedding guests, and he stopped one of them and forced him to listen. How he has forced him to listen is part of the un, uh, things that is obscure and mysterious and intriguing, actually. So he stops just one of the three wedding guests and forces him to listen. Now, he, at first, he, he grabs him with his skinny hand, line nine, and says, hold off, unhand me, gray beard loon. F soon as his hand drops he, but now he holds on to him with his eye. So a sense of supernatural power. He's under uh, the control of the ancient mariner, not with his hand, but with his will in some way. How that happens or what's going on, that's unclear. Yes? But then it talks about him listening like he's a three-year-old child. So I guess I took that to mean more just that he becomes interested in the story now that there's a supernatural power and it's within the man. <laughs> yes. But it says the mariner hath his will as well, right? Yes. 
Yes, so he's not. So is it because he's compliant and therefore like a three-year-old child, or is it that he is uh, weak-willed like a three-year-old child and can't? I have no idea. It's it, there's amb ambiguity there. Yes. In, uh, oh, that he's lo he, he's totally compliant and can't resist his will. Yeah. Um, it's no, I don't either. I've got a four-year-old, and certainly not um, <laughs> weak-willed in that sense. Um, and he, but he, and he sat on his own. He cannot choose but hear, and then he speaks on. Now, I will also say, and this is uh, maybe just. Uh, so you just don't think it's me saying this. I think uh, Malcolm Geitz's take on this as well is that uh, the story of the Rime of the Ancient Mariner is about Coleridge to some degree. It's to some degree autobiographical. That's a long-standing um, observation. George Wally in 1946, I believe, makes that observation. But I mean, I, I think it's... Um, there's, there's substance to it. Um, many see it as a sort of a mini salvation story. It's a rendering of the gospel, uh, or at least characters from it, or scenes from it, or types from it, if not a direct. I don't think you can read it allegorically, but I do think that there are symbols and scenes and types in there. So the ancient mariner who is speaking, and he note that he stops one of the three wedding guests. I mean, Jesus tells many parables about wedding guests. Many are called, but few are chosen, right? There are those that are invited to the wedding. They don't want to be there. And so Jesus sends them out to pull people in, those who were not invited. And one of, them is, you know, one, of the, one of them is not properly dressed, and so he's thrown out in the outer darkness, wailing and gnashing of teeth and so forth. So those are there. And the reference to the bridegroom, capital B, would add further substance to the idea that he, it, it has in mind uh, Christian story. So who then it would the mariner represent? The mar mariner would represent uh, somebody telling the story of the gospel. A magical story, uh, a compelling story. And when he speaks, the, the person who, hold, who is hearing is transfixed such that he cannot choose but hear as it says here. And he sat on a stone. Is the stone Christ, the rock? Yeah, yeah, you can say it starts to stretch, but but okay, but the more you note similarities, the stronger the sense that there's something symbolic here. What exactly the symbolism is, unclear. He also drops below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. Now the kirk is a Scottish word for church. A lighthouse um, and a hill uh, not biblical words, but they're Christian words. Um, it's not a kid's song, My Lighthouse, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Um, and they go down, and they go down, and they drop beneath the lighthouse. So they drop below the kirk, below the hill. And note that he says, we drop. So they're going, and if you think about that, because the world is round, when you, when you are sailing or when you're driving, even if you're driving on what appears to be flat ground, eventually you disappear from sight, not just because you're far away, but because actually the earth is curved. So you lose sight of somebody. Now here it's depicted as they drop down. And maybe that's how it appears if I'm on the flat and somebody goes that they are going down. And there's a sense, however, that that is what's going on here, is that they are going down to, a, to an underworld. The underworld is... Uh, when it's described, is described as a very dangerous place, a place where there are icebergs and so forth. Now, you may say, what does that have to do with the underworld or a hellish landscape? Remember back to your Dante, mm -hmm. <coughs> where surprising to everyone, despite the fact that the first uh, canticle is called the Inferno, as you get further and further down into the uh, depths of hell, it gets colder and colder to the point where everything is st stuck in ice. Right? Remember? Um, after Dante, icy landscapes have the connotations of hell. In Russian literature to this day, by the way, uh, ice and snowstorms 
uh, are, are, are evocative of evil, <coughs> which is not hard to believe as a Canadian after this winter. Um, <laughs> but in general, one thinks of, of hell as a very hot place, uh, a desert or something like that. Well, that's the landscape, of course, of the Middle East in, in uh, Israel and so forth. But in, in, in European literature, particularly after Dante, it's, it's ice and snow that has the connotations of hell. I'm not saying that everyone who uses it that way intends that, but I am saying that, uh, that Coleridge probably does have that in mind here. So he drops below the hill, below the lighthouse top, so it's no longer being lit by um, our civilization, and now he goes down into the underworld and will experience very dark things. Uh, they cross the Atlantic. Now let, let's let's ha let's have a look, and I'll read the gloss that went along this as well, just to show how odd the gloss is. So it starts off: An ancient mariner meeteth three gallants hidden to a wedding, uh, bi bidden to a wedding feast, and detaineth one. The wedding guest is spellbound by the eye of the old seafaring man and constrained to hear his tale. The mariner tells how the ship sailed southward with a good wind and fair weather till it reached the line. I think at this point, it's already the literal reading of the gloss is in tension with the sense that there's something more than meets the eye here. It's not just that they're sailing southward, but the wedding guest heareth the bridal music, but the mariner continueth his tale. Okay. But that's what it says in the gloss. In the text, the wedding guest beats his breast. Where's the reference in the gloss? No mention. The, the wedding guest is distressed here. Why? The gloss is not interested in it at all. Just, so at, what we are getting the sense of is an unreliable narrator. The gloss is unreliable. So just because it, and, and Coleridge is, I think, making a comment about criticism and the way it subverts the authorial intention, which I think is, is good counsel. Uh, given, I'll give you a, an example for yourselves. If you have Bibles, you often will have study Bibles, and there will be, the, you know, at the bottom of the text, there will be, if you're in a study, well, what does this mean? This is, I'm not sure, and somebody, somebody will quickly read to the bottom, read the text, and say, hot, so there you go. That solves it. As if, you know, the text itself was quite challenging. But reading what someone who is the editor or a commentator has said makes it much clearer, okay, why do we regard that statement as authoritative? I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying that the resolution of the um, problem may be more problematic. I mean, the text is challenging. Does the clarity, while it sort of relieves us of the uh, burden of having to wrestle with the challenge of the text, does it actually do us any favors? Are we not meant to wrestle with the text? Some truths you have to take time with and, and struggle with. And, uh, and not everything comes immediately and quickly and easily. But, it, but for critics, critics always give you the clear, simple explanation. And I think that's what Coleridge is uh, observing here, because he was very aware of what was going on in that area, particularly, particularly in the uh, higher criticism of the Bible, which was happening at this time. And Coleridge was well aware of that. Anyway, so he hears the loud bassoon. The mariner continues his tale. The ship driven by a storm towards the South Pole, the land of ice and of fearful sounds where no living thing was to be seen till a great sea bird called the albatross came through the snow fog and was received with great joy and hospitality. And lo, the albatross proveth a bird of good omen and followeth the ship as it returned northward through fog and floating ice. Now, does it say anything about the bird of good omen in the text? It's an interpretation. It's divergent from the text. I'm not saying it's groundless, but it is now gone from under-reading the text to over-reading it. 
Coleridge is alerting us to the problems of reading, the difficulties of reading well. He goes on, and then finally, the ancient mariner inhospitably killeth the pious bird of good omen. That's a value judgment. It was inhospitable. Well, that's an interesting thing. How do you show an albatross hospitality? Is our natural creature something to which we owe, you know, hospitality something that you show a guest? Yes? Um, I understand what you're saying about the commentary being uh, sort of a commentary on self harm, how Plutus is it. But being the author himself, doesn't he also have the authority to add whatever commentary he likes about the commentary? Of course. Oh, I'm not saying it's illegitimate. <laughs> I'm saying that the in addition to writing the poem, He's decided he will also add another layer to it, which is the way in which prose commentaries um, will be regarded as having a greater authority than the original texts. Now, he's the one who's included there, but he's made it divergent, uh, and so much so that readers will be aware of that fact. People tend to reduce everything to prose and clear and simple explanations, so they're not bothered or troubled anymore. And, uh, and he's troubled by the fact that they're no longer troubled, if that makes any sense. It does to me. <coughs> that doesn't mean anything. Yes? So he's, at, so he's adding helpful information. Yeah. Yes. Someone in that time period, since it's ancient, yeah. it's trying to stand. Yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't be like a contrast. Between yes, and, and so I, I agree. At this stage in part one, the, de, the problems posed by the gloss are not too great. There's some discrepancy, but we're not altogether saying, you've gone way off the reservation here. This is not kosher. Sorry, analogies, but you, 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 this is not quite connecting here. You're going too far. As we will read on, then we'll find that not only uh, is there a discrepancy, it, it does go completely divergent from the text. And that in itself is interesting. And, and maybe he writes too much about it. By the way, that this is also a comment. Uh, 1830, so years after it was written, there were a couple of criticisms by a, a, a writer great poet herself by the name of Anna Letitia Barbeau. Uh, and she, Coleridge replies to her, so I'll just read, uh, read to you. Mrs. Barbeau once told me that she admired the ancient bar mariner very much, but that there were two faults in it. It was improbable, and it had no moral. As for the probability, I owned that that might admit some question. But as to the want of a moral, I told her that in my judgment the poem had too much and that the only or chief fault, if I may say so, was the obtrusion of the moral sentiment so openly on the reader as a principle or cause of action in a work of pure imagination. I'll stop the quotation there. So uh, Barbeau is a Christian, by the way, reading it and saying that it lacks a moral. Well, when we come to the end of it, you can decide for yourselves whether it lacks a moral. But, and Coleridge's response is it has too much of that, as opposed to a work of pure imagination. And I think that also is an interesting comment. If it's, imagina if it's a work of pure imagination, can it not have a moral? Why would he think that it ought to? But let's, let's read on. Part two. <clears throat> the sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work him woe. For all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. Nor dim nor red like God's own head, 
the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred, I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Twas right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, twas sad as sad could be. And we did on, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath, nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. The famous lines here. Water, water, everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water, everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue, through utter drought, was withered at the root. We could not speak, no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, that e what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. So that ends part two. Uh, let me read the gloss, and then I will comment. So his shipmates cry out against the ancient mariner for killing the bird of good luck. But when the fog cleared off, they justify the same and thus make themselves accomplices in the crime. The fair breeze continues. The ship enters the Pacific Ocean and sails northward even till it reaches the line. The ship ha hath been suddenly becalmed <coughs> and the albatross begins to be avenged. A spirit had followed them, one of the invisible inhabitants of the planet, neither departed souls nor angels, concerning whom the learned Jew Josephus and the Platonic Constant Constantinopolitan Michael Tzelis may be consulted. They are very numerous, and it is no climate or element without one or more. The shipmates in their sore distress would fain throw the whole guilt on the ancient mariner in sign whereof they hang the dead seabird round his neck. Okay, now note the gloss. It's adding a lot of information. It's giving us information well beyond what's in the text, and not only beyond the text, it's citing as authorities and, uh, and certainties so that we have reason to believe the, uh, the gloss more than we have to believe the text, because now he's citing authorities. We can, we can consult the learned jo, Jew Josephus, who speaks of Jesus um, in, in his histories, or um, one of the Eastern churchmen, Michael uh, Tzelis, about uh, the invisible inhabitants of the earth. And he began a quotation with that, by the way, from Thomas Burnett. But at, at that point, the, it, it's also giving us the interpretation of what's going on in the text. Now, some of it's useful. Some of it goes, gives us more information than we could ever have come up with if we'd read it multiple times. And what's particularly interesting is it seems to give a theological reading of the text at this point. Right at first, they cry out against him, you killed the bird of good luck. Then they, when the sun rises up, they switch their opinion immediately and said, you killed the bird of bad luck. Because of course now the sun's risen. So it, and thereby I would conclude that the mariner's judgment is not to be trusted. They just judge on the basis of what they see, not on the basis of the way things are. The judgment of the narrator or the gloss is that by justifying the killing of the bird, they make themselves accomplices in the crime. Now, I would never have come to that conclusion just based on the reading of the text. 
but the but what's interesting is because of that what happens after this makes sense because they're all going to die for the killing of the bird all, every last one of them not not the mariner himself but the rest of them now they hang the albatross around his neck, neck like a scapegoat that's what they're doing so the albatross to to wear an albatross around your neck is to bear the condemnation of others it's a it's a figure of speech in english to this day so it's a, sim it's a symbol of sin their sin has been transferred to him so now we're going to get something like uh, a crime against nature by killing the albatross against hospitality and against god or the spiritual realm if you will and then a judgment for it a divine judgment which is going to be prosecuted by these spirits and uh, the reference to the water there by the way uh, you can't drink ocean water in case you didn't know if you're thirsty don't drink that water you will die very very quickly well, you would know that anyway i assume you're thirsty, no matter, the water looks good, I'm so thirsty, and there's a lot of water there, well, you cannot drink that water. That is gonna do the very thing that you don't want to happen. It's gonna dry you right out. So you can desalinate it, as we would say, but through some means, but you, but you can't drink it. And furthermore, they're stopped, they're stopped still. So the wind that was blowing the sailboat on has now stopped and they are in a hellish landscape not in the icy sense but in the hot sense so now it is more like we, what we would think of as hell and a judgment and there's rotting going on here and they're all stuck in it part three there passed a weary time each throat was parched and glazed each eye a weary time a weary time how glazed each weary eye when looking westward i beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist. And still it neared and neared, as if it dodged a water sprite. It plunged and tacked and veered. So there's no wind, yet this thing is coming towards them. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could not we could nor laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood and cried, a sail, a sail. Because he, he couldn't speak, his tongue was so dry, he couldn't, he incapable, incapable of speaking, so he bites his arm in order to have enough saliva in his mouth to speak. <laughs> a sail, a sail, with throats unslaked, with black lips baked, agape they heard me call. Mercy, they for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in, as, as they were drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more, hither to work us wheel. Without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame, the day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad bright sun. When that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars. Heaven's mother send us grace. So it's like they're in prison. Come between them and the source of light. As if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? Are you know what gossamers are? Um, the uh, little tiny feathers under a, under a, a goose's wings. So there are goose feathers, and then there's the down underneath it. It's called gossamer from a goose. Gossamer. You know how light they are? The goose down. Those are that's gossamer. Very light. almost transparent are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate and is that woman all her crew is that a death and are there 
to is death that woman's maid. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was as white as leprosy. The nightmare, life in death, was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out, at one stride comes the dark. With far heard whisper o'er the sea off shot the spectre bark. We listened and looked sideways up. Fear at my heart as at a cup my lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night, the steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white. From the sails the dew did drip, till clomb above the eastern bar the horned moon, and with one bright star within the nether tip. One after one by the star dog moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan, with heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow. So now the analogy being drawn between the death of the albatross and the death of the sailors, just like the crossbow which shot the uh, albatross, here's the punishment. Now the punishment is a consequence of a game of dice and they're playing dice with death. <clears throat> there's death and there's life and death. There's a woman and there is some other creature. Now these creatures probably will bring uh, to mind a text that we've read this semester already, or no? What text would that be, if you can think? A woman, hmm? not the rape of the lock, a woman and a terrible thing beside, sin and death, Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, they're not exact correspondences, but there's a woman and there's a, another figure. Is that a, de a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? So he's not clear which of them is which is which here. Probably sin and death. The portrait of the lady being in red uh, draws to mind the book of Revelation, the portrait of a uh, woman of sin there, the harlot. Um, and the nightmare life and death was she, sin, and the other is not even mentioned per se, but he's death, but she wins the game. They will experience life and death. Their souls fly out from their bodies in the same way the arrow flies out of the crossbow. So there's a consequence to that. Now if you look at the um, gloss, we're told that they are death and life and death. And they've diced for the ship's crew, and she, that is life and death, winneth the ancient mare now. She wins him, but the others die. Which is worse, to die or to be the prey of life in death? Anyway, something particularly ominous is happening here at this point. For which reason, part four, we now have an interruption. The interruption is of the wedding guest. Because if you think about it, he's just recounted the tale of how he went south on a boat and everyone is killed by two supernatural beings playing dice and he's the only one that survived and he has been possessed by her. And now he's telling the ancient telling the wedding guest his tale, so now the wedding guest has good reason to fear the one who's telling him his tale, that he also is being possessed. So it begins with those, those sentiments. I fear thee, ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body dropped not down. 
Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men, so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray. But or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. So he wishes to pray, he can't pray. He's prevented from prayer. So he's caught and can't release himself from that plight. I closed my lids and kept them closed, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea, and the sea and the sky, lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look with which they looked on me ne had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon, it's life and death, is it not worse? The moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide. As softly she was going up and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main like April hoar frost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt away a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green, and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck, so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Okay, so let me just comment on this. This is an interesting passage. If, if you do buy the analogy that this is a sort of a... Uh, a supernatural rendition of something law, like a uh, move towards salvation or a, a, an embrace of salvation or rather uh, somebody being brought from death to life. The mariner then is the storyteller who himself is for, brought from death to life and brought from death to life not by his own means but by some power beyond him. He can't even pray himself. He's incapable of it. His lips are dry. His tongue is dry. And the, the, the turning point in the story, because he's cursing, he's seeing these living creatures and he's disgusted by them at first, but he's eventually brought to uh, love the unlovable things. And at that point, right at that point, when he sees that they have beauty, no tongue their beauty might declare, line 283, a spring of love gushed from my heart, as if he were born again. So his life bubbles up from within. And at that point, then he can pray. So this is about election. He's been called and he's been chosen and he is brought to life despite his transgression. And, and when he prays and blesses them, nobody's he's unaware of it even, at that point, his sin has been atoned for and it falls from his neck and it's done. Yes? It does say though, it does say though, he, he blessed them. So there was some sort of action. But unaware. So it's a, yeah, what's going on there? That's a funny old thing. Yeah. So is that, the word bless, is that in the sense of to say something? Normally it is. But how can you bless unaware? What he's trying to suggest with unaware is that it's not a rational conscious decision to follow Christ, if you will. When I say follow Christ, I'm obviously over-reading the text. 
that's not in the text. It, uh, Coleridge would probably object that's too much moral in the story is to add that detail. And that I think that's his response to Mrs. Barbo. Mrs. Barbo is saying, you ought to make it clear that he's coming to follow Christ at that point. I admire this very much, but would you be a bit clearer? And he, his response is, it's a little too clear already because the analogy is a little bit too close, like Aslan, right? This is a little bit too close. It's patent that I am talking about something similar, and for that reason, it's not a work of pure imagination. At least that's how I understood Stan him to be um, thinking here. And I'll be very interested in hearing what uh, Coleridge's latest biographer has to say about it because he has dealt with this, doubtless, uh, in far greater detail than I have. I mean, I've taught on it for years, but that's not quite the same. Um, and at that point, he, so he blesses them unaware, and then he, but he attributes that, sure, my kind saint took pity on me. So he's, he's ascribing the agency of this act to someone outside of himself. Whether the ascription is correct, that it was a saint, um, that's another matter. He may be superstitious, he may be wrong, but he is aware of the fact that it's not coming from within him. And he is talking about the influence of the supernatural, which he presents, as he said at the outset, as something entirely real and believable. Remember, both poets, when you take them together, the Wordsworth and Coleridge, are wanting to give credence to the idea that there is such a thing as the supernatural. And it is powerful, and it is real, and it is uh, all around us. Coleridge's depiction of it is a little bit closer to a Christian depiction than Wordsworth's is, I would say, just in terms of the um, presentation and the order of events. But neither of them are exactly orthodox or, you know. Would you say that Coleridge is using the Christian images more just to his advantage? That is a very good question, and I don't know what the answer to it is. I genuinely don't know. Uh, so he writes, so this is the odd thing, and this is typically Coleridgean. He should have been an academic. I mean, he was an academic in certain respects. Because on the one hand, he's the one who wrote the story. But his criticism of his own story, which he's done to some degree by throwing a gloss in there, even commenting after the fact is there's too much moral in it. He should have made it less obvious than he did which is a funny old criticism. Why did you do that then? Why would you put it the way you did put it then if you think it's too much? Because you've changed the poem sub substantially, why wouldn't you change that? And, and, and does, he think that, does he really think that about himself or does he say that in response to her because he thinks that she's excessively moralistic? And so it's the response that you don't understand how poetry and art works, which is that you if you're if you're trying to get out of it a lesson, then you're not allowing the text to actually work upon you. And so there's something about how the reader reads. The reader is letting the text work upon him and not trying to impose a moral reading upon the text. I think that's the, the gist of it. Again, you have to know that Mrs. Barbo is an evangelical critic. And so maybe he's responding not as a general statement, but in response to her. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But at any rate, at that point, he sleeps, and the dead who were on the ground, I'm going to skip over a bit because we won't get through this otherwise, uh, a wind rises up, and they, the dead men gave a groan, 330, they groaned, they stirred, they all uprose. So now the crew, now they have a crew. The dead are the crew that will operate the ship, that will bring the ship back home. Nor spake, nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. So to add to the sense of the uncanny in the passage. Dead men are piloting the ship, 
and there's no breeze, and yet now it's moving. So what is moving them? Uh, 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 uh. The mariners all again the work the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me, knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. Now this is interesting. Isn't that a fantastic way? This is my brother's son, but he calls him the body. It's him, but it's not him. He doesn't say he. So he does say it's his brother's son, but then he calls it, in order to suggest the alienation, he just calls it the body. Now, the, in terms of human nature, every human being has a body. If somebody punches you in the nose, they hit you. They haven't hit your nose. They've hit you. The nose is a part of you. You can't differentiate the two. But if you start saying, um, if you start thinking of your nose as not a part of you, which nobody ever does, then you would be distancing himself, yourself from your body in a way that's not really possible to do. But when he calls his brother's son the body, he's suggesting it, it, it is both him and it is also not him. It's like a zombie. It's the undead. And the body and I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. And now once again, at this point, the wedding guest breaks in. I fear thee, ancient mariner. Be calm, thou wedding guest. T'was not those souls that fled in pain, which to their corpses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. Okay. So it's... <laughs> that's a great consolation. So it wasn't the dead that rose up. It was spirits in the bodies that made the bodies move. Oh, well, then that's okay. Is he talking about a... Uh, the new birth, have they been given new, is this an, are these new people, a new creation? It doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's so there are spirits inhabiting these bodies. I don't, I'm not less, I'm not less anxious if I'm the wedding guest when I hear the explanation, but it was a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. So now they sang, around, around flew each sweet sound then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky, I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all little birds that are, how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute. And now it is an angel's song and makes the heavens be mute. So this singing, which arises out of this from the spirits that are inhabiting the bodies, is a sense that there is a harmony here, a sense of order and purpose and meaning. Uh, music is one of the signs of, uh, music is beautiful, it's the sign of the uh, conjunction of, of beauty and truth and goodness. So wherever there's, where, wherever there's harmony, we expect good things. In a movie, if you're uh, watching a movie and it's, it's, it's got a good score, when the villain comes in, the music is ominous. When something beautiful is, has happened or is about to happen, the music accompanies it and suggests the beautiful, good thing that's about to happen. So music, so goodness and beauty uh, and, and uh, will go together. Yes? Wouldn't this music be ominous? Not here, apparently not. That's the point. He talks about it as beauty because it's not only the spirits that are singing it, so are all the birds. Individually, corporately, there's a harmony here of voices. And they sing in one side. And the natural world, which is presented as good and unfallen, more or less, is uh, in consonance with the supernatural. Singing together. A quiet tune. And on they go, and on they go. Now at this point, we then we get really strange stuff in the polar spirit, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip over that stuff. Uh, not because uh, it, we couldn't look into it because now we were, we're running short on time. But they get back in the sixth voice because there are voices between them and there's some de to some degree a discussion of something like purgatory here between the two voices. There's a time which he has to pay for this and atone. Yes, he's paid the price, he's come to life. The sin has dropped from his shoulders but he needs to atone for this still. So something like a purgatory discussing between the two voices, uh, the, um, 
the angel speaking on his behalf and the devil's advocate. And then it, uh, they come finally through and then they hear a voice and the voice is, I'll come right to the end of uh, part six and then we'll read to the end. I think we've got time for that. He hears the pilot's cheer. So they've come all the way back and they hear the pilot's cheer, the pilot of a ship that's going to bring them back to the mainland. So a boat, when they come within sight, a boat rows out to meet them and will guide them into the harbor because harbors often have shoals and so forth that they can't see and to keep, prevent them from shipwrecking right within the sight of land. So the pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice. It is the hermit, good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. Do you know what this word shrieve, by the way, means? He'll shrieve my soul. Antiquated, but not obsolete. Yesterday, what was yesterday? There you go. Celebration of Mardi Gras as well. Fat Tuesday in French. Shrove Tuesday in English has a different connotation. To shrieve is to forgive one, a person's sins. Shrove Tuesday is the beginning, uh, the last day before the beginning of Lent. Today is Ash Wednesday. Shrove Tuesday was when you've got everything in your cupboard, all the fatty things, you're going to have a big fat meal with, we call it pancake day. Um, but is in terms of a, a religious holiday, that's what it is. It's, it's, you are going to indulge yourself for the last time before 40 days of repentance, season of Lent. So that's what the shriving means here. And, um, and he'll wash away the albatross's blood. So the holy man will do this. Now this hermit, so the hermit, is uh, no note. Remember the in Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey, there was a hermit there as well. So an isolated figure, and yet a holy man, in some sense. He lives in the presence of nature. He's a natural, yeah. Whatever you want to make of it. When Coleridge writes this, he's not a Christian, by the way. He's a Unitarian. If that means anything to you, he's a rationalist. He does not think that there, he does not believe in the Trinity. He believes that there's a God, but there are not. He's not a Orthodox believer. His father was a Unitarian minister. And he, when he wrote this, would have uh, been in that, uh, of, the, of those same convictions. This hermit, good, lives in that wood, which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a lap far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk. Why, this is a strange I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now? Strange by my faith, the hermit said. And they answered, not our cheer. The planks look warped. And see those sails, look how thin they are and sear. I never saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along. When the ivy tod is heavy with snow and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerfully. The boat came closer to the ship, but I not, nor spoke, spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water, it rumbled on. 
still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams myself I found within the pilot's boat. So the boat goes down. It, as soon as it gets there, it gets the, the point of land, and at that point, having brought him all that way, it sinks to the bottom of the sea with a big crash, and the sound, it goes down very quickly, and he manages to float through this, and the pilot pulls him on board. Uh, I moved my lips, 560. The pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars. Why would the pilot shriek at him? He looked like he was possessed in some way, who knows. But they laughed in song and ha ha, quoth he, full plain, I see the devil knows how to row. His companion, the pilot, is superstitious, thinks that this man is demon possessed. The, mer the hermit sees otherwise, nothing untoward here. And now all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat and scarcely he could stand. Oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Say, quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith. Now at the point in which he is bid to speak, now forthwith this frame of mind was wrenched with a woeful agony which forced me to begin my tale and then it left me free. So he's under the possession until the point which he tells his tale. And at that point, and as he says, since then, 582, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. Maybe a reference to, the, to Wesley and his conversion. When he felt strangely warmed at, uh, 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 at the sound of the gospel and changed his life and started preaching the gospel, felt convicted to do so, was restless until that point when he did that. And, and so this is a man possessed to, to preach and tell the tale of what has happened. Now the tale he tells is not of the gospel, it's of some sort of natural and supernatural version of uh, events, of, of sin and, and death and redemption and regeneration, and then of preaching. And then he passes like night from land to land I have strange power of speech by the way the word gospel reflects this is this okay good you will know the spell uh, can have the sense of news so uh, the uh, Greek is you you angelion the evangelion the good news but spell in English has two connotations one is the news but the other has the sense of a spell, it's magical. So this is a, an incantation. So the word evangelion in Greek was translated by the uh, Anglo-Saxons to gospel because they recognize that this is no ordinary story, this is the story that brings men from death to life. And that's what's described here, the strange power of speech that can transform a life and he himself has been brought from death to life, and he now himself, when he goes to speak, does the same. So whatever you want to make of it, he is describing things that are like the Christian story and, and events of it. And he, the uh, conclusion of it is really odd. He says that, and I'll just give you the trite conclusion, farewell, farewell, 610, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, he prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, who's been st struck and can't move at the outset, with beard with age's hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one who hath been stunned and is of a sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the moral morn. Now this is interesting, because in the, in the original parable, 
that Jesus tells the wedding guests who are compelled to come in, the ones that don't come in are cast into outer darkness, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Here's the man who's just heard the story of the ancient mariner and chooses not to go into the wedding feast. And he goes and he turned from, that this is of his own volition, he turns from the bridegroom's door. He doesn't want to go in there. And he goes like one stunned and of sense forlorn, and he's a sadder and wiser man. So it's a very odd ending then as well. If you want to say it's a, an analogy or a parallel or an allegory of a Christian story, what's with the ending? Does not seem to fit at all. So much mystery there. We can ask. Malcolm Geit, what he makes of it since he's written hundreds and hundreds of pages on this particular poem and its theological significance, as well as the biography of Coleridge. Let's, let's ask him that question and not put it on me here. I like that. Uh, 